A very special event on behalf of a beleaguered religious minority took place in Los Angeles recently. Mel Gibson, Nina Shea, Ambassador Sam Brownback, and others raise awareness about the plight of persecuted Christians in the Middle East. And a former high school football coach's fight over silent prayer is being heard this week at the Supreme Court. Coach Joseph Kennedy is here with his story. And finally, Jessica Hooten Wilson tells us how the lives of the saints can make us better people. The World Over begins right now. Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. We have an inspiring and important show for you tonight, a topic seldom covered. If you'd like to comment, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover. Let's get right to it. The Christian community in the Middle East has long been under threat, and their numbers are dwindling, particularly in Iraq, the cradle of Christianity. For years, we have covered this much-abused community, and during Easter, it seems the perfect time to turn our attention to the suffering Christians in the Holy Land. What can be done to support these persecuted Christians struggling for survival? Actor and Oscar-winning director Mel Gibson, along with philanthropist Mike Illich, recently organized a charity event called Give to Live in Los Angeles. They wanted to raise awareness and support for the beleaguered Christian community in Lebanon, who get very little media attention and even less support. Here's Mel Gibson explaining what inspired him to become involved. I didn't know much about this, you know, the persecution in the Middle East with Christians, the Chaldean Christians in particular, in Syria, in um, Iraq, flooding into Lebanon, refugees. And, uh, and then I heard voices, and uh, they were the voices of Bishop Kasahi. These are boots on the ground men um, who have witnessed this stuff, they see it, and they they do. They try their hardest to do something about it. But of course, you don't hear about this. It's not on the front page. It's not even on the back page. But it is a severe problem. I, uh, I listened to them. They acquainted me with the kinds of things they saw, they witnessed, that, that are going on. Um, some things I wish I didn't know, seriously. I wish I didn't know these things. But now, having looked at it and become aware, I, I, I can't turn away. And so I was compelled. To, uh, to do something about it. And one of the first people I spoke to was a new acquaintance of mine, uh, a man named Mike Illich. He's a, a tough and astute businessman with a big, soft heart. And he's a man of God. And he, when he heard this uh, about what was going on, the plight of the Christians in the Middle East, he and his uh, wife, Noel, just jumped in with both hands and feet, and they said, let's do something. And, and this is how Give to Live was born. And uh, this is the inaugural. <laughs> this is the inaugural event in what I hope become many, many more. So, you know, we're going to give it away uh, to where it needs to go. Here you'll hear from an expert panel about the kinds of things uh, that are there. And I hope it doesn't upset you as much as it did me. But in a way, I hope it does because it needs to touch you. I then moderated a panel discussion on the dire condition of these Christian communities in the Middle East and why so many of them are now in Lebanon. I was joined by Nina Shea, director of the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute, former U.S. ambassador at large for religious freedom, Sam Brownback, and author and counsel to the Chaldean Archdiocese of Erbil, Iraq, Stephen Rasha. Nina, I, I want to start with you. In 2000, in Iraq, there were 1.4 million Christians. Today, there are less than 200,000. Why, why is this community, first of all, important? And what happened to these people from the Saddam Hussein reign till today? You know, the, Raymond, this is a critically important community for every Christian. This is one of the 
most ancient Christian churches in the cradle of Christianity. And they are disappearing to the vanishing point on our watch. Um, you gave the statistics. Uh, we heard uh, the priest praying in Aramaic, the language of Jesus of Nazareth, one of the only communities in the world to do that. Uh, they trace their faith to Doubting Thomas, whose relics they harbor, they, um, the, the canon of their, their Eucharistic prayer was developed by St. Jude Thaddeus the Apostle. Um, their monasteries are 1,600 years old. Um, you know, oppression came before through the centuries to these people, but ISIS genocide really stands apart, and it has been recognized as genocide by both administ recent administrations. Um, the survivors of this genocide face a post-apocalyptic state in their homelands. Tell us what's happened to some of the, the men, the elderly, and the women. Yeah. Uh, tell us what's happened yeah. to them. So, since so ISIS um, uh, waged a bloody blitz through Nineveh back in 2014, and they started by designating, stamping a red N on the properties of Christians in Mosul, ancient Nineveh, the center of uh, Iraqi Christianity, and for Nazarene, because they were followers of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, there were no functioning churches, no intact communities, no priests left under the ISIS caliphate. 45 churches were destroyed in Mosul alone. St. Elijah Monastery uh, from uh, 6th century was pulverized into gray dust um, that we saw from satellite pictures by ISIS, demolished. Um, these Christians weren't caught in the middle. They were targeted. ISIS wanted to erase every trace of this uh, ancient civilization, this Christian civilization. Um, they gave an ultimatum to the Christians when they arrived, ISIS, uh, that is. They said, convert, leave, or die. Most fled in a panic. Some died trying. Um, one uh, Iraqi nun, religious sister, told me that 12 of her nuns died in, in the immediate aftermath. But the, uh, those who stayed were the elderly or the disabled. The men were killed. One woman told um, a priest that I spoke to who, who's, who cared for them in the camps um, afterwards that she saw her husband crucified on the front door of their home because he refused to convert. Um, the uh, men were taken away, uh, bound and blindfolded in the back of pickup trucks, never to be seen again. Um, the men were tortured in front of their families or vice versa. Um, women yeah. had a horrific fate. Um, they were taken to slave markets and sold to jihadis as ISIS jihadis as war spoils. Uh, they were a recruiting tool for young jihadi men. Um, you know, I just want to mention quickly, and I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but I just want to mention uh, two cases. One was little Christina, age three. Uh, she was taken to a slave pen. She was snatched from her mother's lap in uh, 2014. And um, we know about this because Rana, another Christian woman in her 20s, was also at the slave pen and had, um, waiting to be sold, and she had a cell phone and called back to their community and told them about Christina and that she was taking care of her, the three-year-old, until she was given away, the, the three-year-old. Um, Christina, I'm happy to say, was found in the liberation of Mosul three years later. Um, Rita is another woman, and Rana was eventually liberated as well um, with the liberation of Mosul. Rita um, Ayub was in her 30s. She was married to eight men in one night um, with the ISIS sheikh performing the ceremonies. She was eventually sold to a man in Syria and his wife beat her daily for her to convert, she said, until she was bleeding from the head. She would be beaten until she was bleeding from the head. She was also released by the Syrian Democratic Forces in 2017. Um, you know, Sister Diana, the, um, a, a nun from, that I think you've had on your show, Raymond, and um, I think we all know uh, up here, but she is a nun, an Iraqi nun, 
She said this uprooting has just displaced this community body and soul. It has stripped them of everything, including their dignity and their humanity. Steve, tell us what happened to the infrastructure of the Chaldean church in Iraq, and what are, is the state of things in Lebanon today, which is where many of these Christians fled, Syria and Lebanon primarily, and Jordan. Well, um, when, the, when the war came to uh, northern Iraq, the, uh, the international aid community that we all think of as being in place to deal with these things was nowhere to be found. Uh, over uh, nearly 200,000 Christians fled from Mosul and Nineveh. They all fled uh, mostly east, uh, ended up in and around Erbil, which is the, the Kurdish capital uh, in the northern part of Iraq. And there was nobody there to help them, uh, nobody, uh, except for the churches. And it was only through private aid uh, from the churches around the world that came there immediately to help these people, uh, without which there would likely not be a Christian population left uh, in northern Iraq to still save today. And so as the church uh, uh, engaged in this initial triage to take care of them, the expectation was that the UN, that the US, that these other institutional aid organizations would come on board, um, and they never did. They never did. Um, the, it was still two, three, four years later before the first trickling amounts of aid directly to the Christians uh, would come in. And, and one of the main reasons that this aid was, was kept from the Christians uh, was because they refused to go into the camps, the UN camps that were run by Muslims because of what had just happened to them. So the church took care of them. They uh, refused to go into the UN camps, and, and then they were stuck in a situation where the governments uh, said, well, we're not going to help you. Uh, if you go into the UN camp, we'll help you, but we're not going to help you, even though the church was taking care of these uh, refugees at a rate that was, uh, was, was substantially less than what the UN was paying. Typically, we did that in the church at about 5% overhead on, on dollars, whereas the UN was, was 50% uh, overhead. So we had these, these situations, and then there were families that were from Mosul, in uh, the towns around Mosul, and their homes had been completely destroyed, and there was just nothing for them to go back to. Those people fled mostly into the diaspora in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. Uh, and that's the situation that we have now. There are over 70,000 uh, Christian refugees, and they don't even qualify for refugee status uh, under the current way that our international aid paradigm works. They're just stateless, homeless people. And they're trapped in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan with no place to go. No place to go and nobody who will take them in. No home to go back to. Ambassador Brownback. Speak to me, you've been to the region, you've seen the carnage and the fallout here. First of all, to pick up on what Steve was talking about, where was and is big charity? What happened to USAID, the UN? Uh, I know you labored very hard during the Trump administration to divert some of these funds to the Christians in the Holy Land. What happened there? What, what happened is, is that big government does big. It doesn't do small. Big government uh, replaces power plants. Uh, it can redo a road, but it doesn't do a home. It doesn't start a job. Uh, it, it does big. And it doesn't replace churches because of the Establishment Clause, even though I think there's a clear argument they should do that. But these churches were all desecrated. I went into a church there in the region, just completely mauled the whole thing. And they exhumed a, a priest that had been buried there in the church to desecrate his body. They're in the in the, the church, they actually did. I'm going, what, what kind of mindset does it take to do that? But they did. And th this was all about, really, it was like in, putting a, trying to put a spiritual dagger into the heart of Christianity. I mean, there's a lot of spiritual darkness that's with this. And that's what they were doing. And they seek to remove all traces of Christianity so Christianity cannot be claimed 
in this area whatsoever, and they're pretty close to getting it done, is the sad part about it. It requires people like you and people in the United States to stand up uh, for them, stand up for them politically, stand up for them and help them financially. I saw a diocese in Phoenix area rebuild a church. They'd made connection with people there and they just helped rebuild the church. Uh, and if the United States and people here don't do this, it won't happen. I didn't understand it when I first started looking at this. The role that Christians play in the region, they really are a bridge of peace in many, many ways and have maintained that peace over millennia now. Nina, talk about that and how we see the depleting of Christianity from the Middle East and the rising of tensions and violence. You know, these Christians are known as uh, modernizers. They brought hospitals and colleges and um, printing presses to the Middle East. Civilization. Uh, they, they are uh, considered um, uh, moderators because they don't have the militias. Uh, they didn't have any protectors or their own militias in Iraq. And um, so they were extremely vulnerable. Um, and then there are the mediators between East and West. They have been a buffer um, between the, the uh, Muslim factions who are or the Sunnis and the Shiite who are at war with each other. So um, they are peaceful people. They've been very important. And I think it's really um, important to the United States national security. It really shows, I mean, uh, Ambassador, you've been going around saying all the time how there's this overlap between uh, religious freedom between our ideals and our uh, security needs. And um, that's, I think it's very clear. Religious freedom is the fundamental human right. It was a, it was a right given to us by God. Remember, God had to give us freedom of our own souls to do with whatever we choose. And he knew we would get it wrong and he'd have to send his son to clean it up even. So, I mean, if you just think about that, this is a huge thing that God gave us. No government has the right to interfere with that. And then we see governments manipulating it all over right. the place, and it leads to insecurity. Because then, if the Christians can't practice, the ISIS can come in and let's just, let's just slaughter them. So every genocide in the last hundred years, I think except one, has been of a religious minority because religious freedom is not protected. Stephen, tell us why this is so critical to maintain. Because some people might say, oh, well, they're on the run. They can come here. They can go elsewhere. Why is it important to protect this community and continue it? And it's linked to every Christian in the room and in the world. Well, so the Christianity that's in Iraq is, is a Christianity that was brought to them by the first apostles in the first century. They are amongst the oldest Christians on earth. And uh, the Bible that you read is full of those places and that story. Our faith comes from that original Christianity. The everyday language of the Christians in northern Iraq is Aramaic. Their everyday language, not just their liturgy. Their everyday language is, is in Aramaic. And to give you an idea of what they're faced with, um, uh, you see, the picture's worth a thousand words. So in, in the pictures you see scrolling up there, there's one picture you, you see of a group of young children, uh, uh, altar, uh, altar servers, uh, they're, they're in red capes. That's in the town of Batnaya. That's in uh, northern Iraq, just outside of Mosul. And I took that picture in Easter of 2017 that was in a bombed out church. It was the first church that, where they had been able to celebrate back uh, since, uh, since ISIS had taken over that town two years earlier. That town was liberated in November of 2016. And the day after it was liberated, I was in that town with three of the other priests to document it for the church. And we were in the chapel of the Virgin Mary in that church. We found the, the Virgin Mary statue had been put up and decapitated. But the graffiti on the wall said, oh, you slaves of Christ, there is no place for you in the land of Islam. Either get out or we will kill you. 
And that was not in Arabic. That was in German. In German. Those were German-speaking ISIS fighters in northern Iraq. So think on that. Think on that and the enormity of the problem that these people face. A Ambassador Brownback and, and Nina, I want your take on this. I, I, I want to sort of fast forward to where these Christians have sought safe harbor, which is primarily in Lebanon. Tell us about the dangers and threats that these Christians face in Lebanon. The, the, give us a quick thumbnail of the political situation and how China and Russia and other countries are beginning to take an interest in Lebanon. Lebanon has been a traditional sanctuary for Christians in the Middle East, and as they've suffered attacks from place to place over the centuries, they went to Lebanon to um, have security, and, and including uh, many of the Armenians and those uh, other um, religions from uh, other Christian streams from, from um, uh, Turkey uh, went to Lebanon during that period. Um, they, um, Lebanon was a very special place because they were able to, the different sects, Sunni, Shiite, Christian, were able to um, cohabitate peacefully for the most part, and there was a Christian, and there is a Christian leadership in, um, a president in, um, in, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, so, you know, it's been very important, and, and, and now it, its economy has completely collapsed, yeah. completely. Yeah, and, and the government, for all intents and purposes. Uh, Ambassador, tell us about not only the, the stress these people are under, but the role of Hezbollah, which is an Iranian-backed militia group in Lebanon, and how, the threat that presents to the Christian community. The, the Hezbollah threat is that they threaten the Christian community to get, convert or get out, or we kill you. I mean, and, and it's not put subtly either. Uh, and it, this is just, this happens, or people get killed virtually. Most, many of the families in the region will know somebody of their family that has been killed. And you know, we, we look at it here and you go, are you sure? And it's, yes, you can go and you can interview virtually. But remember, the deal kind of in the Middle East was, Israel was gonna be the Jewish country, Lebanon was gonna be the Christian country. And then the rest of it would be run by Islam. Uh, now, that'd be, we'd allow Christian populations to be there. Well, that's not happened in Lebanon. Uh, I mean, a lot of the Christians just get run out. And, and there'll, there'll be subtle ways, there'll be not subtle ways, but it, it's become a place that's pretty highly dysfunctional and very difficult. And the people that are here from Lebanon that survive and stay there should be applauded for staying. We really started for the first time to say, no, we're gonna help you stay where your home is. Uh, because you wanna be there and you shouldn't be run out of your own home and we're gonna fight for religious freedom and we're gonna fight for you to be able to stay in your home country and so it doesn't have to be a singular Sunni Muslim nation. And that's the right policy. That's the thing we should do. It just requires us to really stand up and to push for it. Yeah. Steve, you wanted to add. Yeah, it's a great point by the, the ambassador because while we do have this large amount of, of Christians in the diaspora in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, there still is a core group of about 200,000 Christians that are adamant about staying in their homeland. They want to stay there, and what they need in order to stay there is for groups like this to not forget about them. I'll start with Nina and then go to the Ambassador and then Steve. Why is an organization, a private group and private charity like this one, preferable to what we've been dealing with and going through the UN or even church-run, God bless them, church-run charities um, in the United States where, tell us what happens. What's the difference? Well, um, if I can start the... Um during ISIS period, when the caliphate was intact, when, when all the uh, Christians who had survived were out of Nineveh and were in Kurdistan or Lebanon or some other place, the UN didn't aid them. Uh, the, there was not a single camp in the Middle East, and there isn't one today, run for Christians by the UN. Uh, they, they are expected to go to uh, majority Muslim camps that, uh, where they are persecuted again because the, some of these camps, the big ones in, in Jordan, were actually R&R places for jihadis right. Right. Um, where they'd come and go and get some rest. And, and so these, these Christians were threatened there. 
Um, and, and, and sexually abused. The women and, were sexually, sexually abused, abused and, and targeted. And, and so forth. And, and um, they, they didn't go there. They, they went to their bishops and asked for help all over the region. And these bishops were totally unprepared for this kind of aid a project because uh, ISIS came in in a flash and um, uh, you know they didn't expect it and uh, they took over the Christian areas of, of two countries, mm -hmm. Iraq and Syria, right away. Um, and, and and so um, you know the, the UN, uh, the U.S. gave all its aid to the UN, and so the UN decided. We just wrote them a check, and the UN decided where the aid went, and they went to the big Sunni Muslim centers almost as a counterterrorism. Uh, payment <laughs> rather than the humanitarian aid that it was supposed to be. So we actually paid and incentivized the Christian exodus. Yeah, that's right. Why is a group like this more nimble, Ambassador Brownback, and better disposed to get the aid directly to this community? This big government does big, as I started out. It'll do a power plant, but it can't hug a person. And you don't want government hugging you, let me tell you that <laughs> just a, at the outset. You don't want that. But. I have seen groups like, and you're doing it the right way. You connect with somebody that's there. You got the bishop. This is a reputable person. You connect with them, and then you ask them what are their needs, and then okay, we're going to come in and we're going to help you. And that's and they're going to put 100 percent of the money on the target government. If we get less than 50 percent, if we get close to 50 percent, really great project. Uh, you know, if we can do it that way. Steve, you want to amplify? And look, this is one of the reasons we all took part in this. When Mel first told me about this, my first question was, how much staff do you have? They have no staff. It's all volunteers, and the money's going directly to the people providing the aid, which is a good thing, certainly from my perspective. Steve. Yeah, what you need to understand is that when big aid comes, it comes with conditions. And the conditions that it comes with uh, for, for people of faith, for the Christians in the Middle East, uh, the conditions are you essentially have to stop being Christian. All of those things that you hold dear to, all of those things that make you who you are as a people, as a community, well, we want you to set those aside for all of these social justice priorities that we think are of greater importance. I'm going to give each of you 30 seconds to wrap up. The, the, the lasting thought, the idea, you want everyone to keep in mind as they consider how they can help this important cause in Lebanon. The communities are so small at this point that your help can go a long way, can make a difference. Yeah. Steve. Nina's absolutely right. You can move the needle. This is something you can do right now, today. You can decide to be aware, to pay attention, to support these efforts of, of Mike and Mel as this goes along. It will absolutely make a difference. Ambassador. If, if you don't help, it's not going to get done. There's no other country, no other place that's going to do it. That's why you got to yeah. do it. And your dollar there will go 50 times further than it will go in Southern California. So. <laughs> and then His Excellency Michel Kassarji, the Chaldean Bishop of Beirut, spoke at the Give to Live event. My Chaldean Catholic Church is a church of the martyrs. The church here of Mesopotamia, it's a church that has suffered persecution, displacement, and slaughter since the first century of Christianity. Hundreds of thousands of believers, clergy, nuns, were killed because they only believe in Christ as Lord, God, and Savior. A church that has massacred by the hands of the Persian, Muslims, Turks, and ISIS, my country, Lebanon, is going through the most dangerous and delicate stage in his existence. Either we will be in the tormented East, the light and the salt as believer and living witness, or we will migrate by force and be uprooted from our land. My answer is that we want to remain in Lebanon as a free Christian, with our head held high, we do not want to immigrate. So today, I am here with you, ladies and gentlemen. I need your help. Today, I am here to tell you that I don't want to pack my bags and migrate. Today, I want to stay with my people in Lebanon. 
in the East. The cradle of civilization where Christ has born. If you'd like to help support the persecuted Christian community in the Middle East, visit Give to Live. Click on Give at the top of their page. It's a very worthy cause. And the organization tells us they have no administrative costs. A hundred percent of all donations go directly to support the struggling Christian communities in Lebanon and the Middle East, or you can reach them at that address on the screen. And this week, the U.S. Supreme Court is hearing oral arguments in a case brought by a former high school football coach who was suspended and later fired for his refusal to stop praying on the field after games. The Supreme Court took up the matter after a lower court ruling rejected the coach's claims that the school district's actions violated his First Amendment rights to free speech and religious freedom. I spoke earlier with the former coach of Bremerton High School in Washington State, Joseph Kennedy, and special counsel for litigation and communications at First Liberty, representing the coach, Jeremy Dice. Thank you both for being here. Joe, uh, you served as an assistant football coach at your alma mater, Bremerton, from uh, 2008 to 2015. You made a promise to God that win or lose, you would give a prayer of thanks after every game, and you prayed on the field after every game for all the seven years you were there as coach. When and why did your praying on the field become a problem with the school board? Yeah, very interestingly enough, it actually came from a compliment that was received by one of the school administrators from another school administrator who saw what our football program was doing and called and gave a compliment of what we were doing was awesome. So. That's how it all became about was, you know, somebody thinking what we were doing was great. Unbelievable. Joe, uh, according to reports, the school district instructed you that you could pray so long as you were not leading your players in prayer, and you complied with that request. But then the school district issued a new policy that said you could not pray where others might see you. How is that constitutional? That's the thing I, you know, I need, really needed to get legal help because, you know, I'm a high school football coach. I'm a former Marine. I, I know, you know, what the Constitution says of the freedom of religion and freedom, you know, of speech. And then all of a sudden it doesn't apply to me. I, you know, if they want to stop me praying with students, hey, their school, their rules, it might be unfortunate, but I complied with everything. But when they said I can no longer pray and they took away my rights, that's where I, I just, you know, the Marine came out in me and I, they had a fight on their hands. Yeah, well, it's not only a, a right to free speech, a right to practice religion, but also freedom of assembly. Jeremy, uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which sided with the school district, said that Coach Joe was engaging in, quote, public speech of an overtly religious nature, end quote, while on the job as a public employee. They added that the school district could have violated the Constitution by, quote, allowing the coach to pray at the conclusion of football games in the center of the field with students who felt pressured to join him. How can this be when the coach engaged in non-coerced private prayer, which he didn't lead the players in? Yeah, that's a question that the Supreme Court is going to have to answer here because the implications of that decision are so wide ranging that if a teacher were seen bowing her head in prayer over her lunch in the cafeteria by students, that would be an establishment of religion, according to the school district, and that teacher could be terminated for it. Or if a teacher wore a yarmulke or a hijab or a crucifix around her neck, those are all grounds for, uh, uh, for dismissal because those are uh, overt, uh, how, how did the court put it there? Overt displays of religion by the uh, the teachers here, and that's apparently forbidden by the school district. Well, of course, the, the First Amendment doesn't say that. Instead, the First Amendment protects mm -hmm. coaches like uh, Joe Kennedy to be able to take a knee in silent prayer for 15 or 20 seconds, which is exactly what he did and was fired for. What one administrator called a fleeting prayer uh, while he was at the 50-yard line. Uh, and if that's going to be allowed to stand, then the freedom of religion at this point, the free exercise thereof, really means very little in this country. Yeah, well, I don't understand this case. I mean, uh, you know, if, if he wanted to stay there for a fleeting prayer for 10 seconds or an hour, that's nobody's business but his and those who decide to join him. Doesn't this violate, and I guess you all are arguing this, not only as a First Amendment uh, argument, but are you also including the freedom of assembly as well in that, in the religious rights and the free speech rights? 
We're, we're, we'll include everything that'll stick to the wall and when we go to the Supreme Court of the United States, of course. But look, no one should be banned from praying just because they can be seen by students. And that's exactly what happened here. And I think it's really important for us to remember just how many times the school district here has has moved the goalposts. Coach Kennedy, all he's wanted from the very beginning was the opportunity to, to take one knee in silent prayer for 15, maybe 20 seconds, as if he was tying his shoes out on the 50 yard line, but he was praying. And they said, because they, he can be seen by students, well, that's an endorsement by the state of religion that was somehow unlawful. The only accommodation that they were willing to give was to say, hey, you could go run in the janitor's closet or up in the press box to have your prayer. But no one should have to hide their faith in the janitor's closet or uh, run up to the press box to be able to do that. Students are are able to understand that that's Coach Kennedy praying, that's Joe Kennedy himself out there praying, and understand that the First Amendment actually protects that right to be able to do that very thing. No one should be banned from praying in public. Yeah. Well, this case was rejected by the Supreme Court in 2019, although Justice Sam Alito wrote at the time, quote, the Ninth Circuit's understanding of the free speech rights of public school teachers is troubling and may justify review in the future. What is perhaps most troubling is the Ninth Circuit's opinion is language that can be understood to mean that a coach's duty to serve as a good role model requires the coach to refrain from any manifestation of religious faith, even when the coach is plainly not on duty. Uh, coach Joe, your thoughts when you read that, and uh, I, I can only imagine that you're uplifted that the Supreme Court is at least reviewing this case. Oh, absolutely. The It, it was amazing that, you know, the, what the lower court said, and I, I mean, if any of my players will ever see me and being a good role model, I don't know why thanking, you know, God or, you know, thanking anybody for what they did out in the football field is somehow, you know, a, a bad role model. And it doesn't stop after the football field. I, you know, I go to church, you know, I pray before my meals when my family and I go out to, um, mm -hmm. you know, a restaurant. So am I going to be banned from actually praying anywhere in a public it i i can't understand any of it and i'm just so blessed that the supreme court actually took a look at this because uh i i'm unlike you i'm absolutely boggled by this and i don't understand yeah. the law but it's it's it seems really silly to me yeah no no it seems punitive and targeted at you i mean does this mean any public official has to refrain from grace before meals in public because it might be seen as a public endorsement of religion? I mean, this is none of this follow. This is crazy. Uh, Jeremy, uh, why do you think the Supreme Court decided to review it at this time? Well, I, I think they saw what they needed to see when we brought back more information to them this time. And look, things just got worse. You read from the first Ninth Circuit opinion, the second Ninth Circuit opinion here, especially Judge Smith's, Smith's opinion in that, that case. Uh, in the, the the dismissal for on bonk reasons, hey, he he said that not only is Coach Joe, uh, you know, trying to just put on a show here by by engaging in prayer, which is the last thing he was attempting to accomplish, he said at the very end that uh, Coach Joe was not following the instructions of the Sermon on the on the Mount, and and he was effectively a bad Christian. And on top of all this, that's a federal judge trying to sit in judgment of how Coach Kennedy practices his faith. Well, that's precisely why we have First Amendment, so that federal judges are never sitting in judgment over someone's free exercise of religion. Right. If the promise in Tinker v. Des Moines means anything, that neither students nor teachers shed their constitutional rights when they walk through the schoolhouse gates, it has to mean that he can take a knee in silent prayer by himself for 15 or 20 seconds after a football game. To say otherwise devoids or uh, empties the, the First Amendment of all meaning. Yeah. Following the announcement that the Supreme Court would be hearing your case, Coach Joe, uh, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State CEO Rachel Laser, representing the school districts, released this statement. No child attending public school should have to pray to play school sports. The lower courts have repeatedly ruled in the school district's favor, and the Supreme Court should likewise recognize that the Bremerton School District did the right thing to protect the religious freedom and ultimately the safety of children, end quote. Joe, did you ever force your players to pray or give preferential treatment to those players? Yeah. You know, I, 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 I'm in agreement with them. If I force my players to pray to play, I should have been fired. Anybody, anybody forcing somebody to exercise faith of any kind or, or banning them you know, it's just as bad. 
the whole idea that mm. I would ever do that. I've had players that were non-believers and approached me. Well, guess what? Those are the guys that are leading my team. Those are my team captains because they, they're not afraid to stand up for what they believe in. But, you know, mm. praying to play is just the most ridiculous thing. And I got like 400 kids that I coached over the years. Find somebody who would ever say anything like that. It's That's absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, what do you make of Rachel Lazer's statement that the Bremerton School District protected religious freedom and the safety of children and the Supreme Court should follow the lower court rulings? Was the safety of children ever in question in this case? This is absolutely backwards what she's been saying all along here because the facts just simply don't comport with reality that as she presents them. The reality is this, that Coach Kennedy from the very beginning has just sought one thing and that was to take a knee in silent prayer by himself. He's done absolutely everything he can to avoid a lawsuit. It was only because Bremerton uh, High, uh, School District continued to move the goalposts in this game, uh, in this issue, that we're at the Supreme Court of the United States. At any moment, they could have restored this and just simply accommodated him for 15 or 20 seconds on a knee in silent prayer at the 50-yard line by himself. It's important to well, remember yeah. when they said, hey, you can't play with, pray with the kids. He said, absolutely, I get it. Those are your rules, and I understand. And he stopped, mm -hmm. and the school district complimented him for stopping. Uh, they only terminated yeah, well, him when he was unwilling to bend his, on his we, commitment. We shouldn't be, yeah, we, 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 you protect children's religious freedom by giving them the freedom to exercise their faith, not segregating them and marginalizing them from any religious expression or practice. That is not well protecting kids' <laughs> religious freedom. Sorry. Uh, Coach Joe, the Supreme Court will hear oral arguments uh, for the case in the spring. What do you hope will be the result of that, and how do you think this case will affect others who feel they can't publicly demonstrate their faith for fear of being fired or sidelined? Well, initially, you know, the, the first and for, foremost is, you know, be able to coach again, to be back on the football field and just mm -hmm. having, you know, the ability to be a coach. Second is to be able to thank God for doing that, giving me that opportunity. So when it comes up this spring, uh, you know, I'm just I'm just happy they're going to hear it and the religious freedom of all Americans. I don't care what faith you are, but that should be protected. And, and nobody should be told mm -hmm. that you have to pray a certain way and you will lose your job if you, if you have any kind of faith. That's just wrong in America. Yeah. Coach, where do you want to where do you want to coach uh, when when this is all over? Do you want to return to oh, Bremerton? Well, well, absolutely. Bremerton is, uh, you know, I'm. if I ever received a job offer from anywhere else, it, it would be, you know, it, that's not even an issue. It's all about Bremerton. I, me and my family, all my kids went there. I went there. Uh, we've all worked at the school district. So it's it's really important to give back to our, you mm -hmm. know, community where we grew up. Mm. Coach Joseph Kennedy, Jeremy Dice, I thank you both for being here. And we will keep our eyes on this case. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We'll keep an eye on this story as it develops. The Supreme Court's expected to hand down its decision before its summer recess begins in late June. How can we use our imaginations to become better people? To tell us, I'm joined by resident scholar at the University of Dallas and author of the new book, The Scandal of Holiness, Renewing Your Imagination in the Company of Literary Saints. Jessica Hooten Wilson joins us. Hi, Jess. I, I, I want to begin with your interest in holiness. You say in a recent interview that your interest arose uh, out of a Fulbright Award. Uh, you, you were teaching at a university in Czechoslovakia, and people there recognized you as being from the U.S., but they had no idea you were a Christian, and that bothered you. Why? Yes. So I was in the Czech Republic, and they recognized I was American. You know, I wasn't smiling, um, or I was smiling too much. I wasn't keeping my stone face the way that a lot of them had kind of been enculturated to do. Um, so they recognized that, but nothing about my life struck them as Christian. And when I was teaching, I was teaching at Charles University, and I would teach these religious novels, these novels with these holy characters and holy fools. They were stunned that I could actually believe these things. How can an educated professor want to live like this? You know, what looked foolish in their eyes. And I, I realized that's what I needed to be doing. I needed to look more foolish in my own life, to look more like the characters I was teaching so that I could actually say, yeah, I believe this. This is true. 
In your introduction, you write about the current culture uh, and the reading of great books. Uh, this is from the, the intro. Somehow, the call to read great books has become a rebellious mantra. Uh, once an innocuous pastime, reading literature in our current culture is a way of protesting. Can you imagine anything more countercultural in this society than to say no thank you to Netflix? Every culture has heroes. Every culture chooses whom to remember and to revere. As Christians, we've not lost our capacity to adore heroes, but we are uncomfortable venerating anyone unless it's an NFL player, the latest Christian guru, or a superhero. If the church decides not to uplift saints, its members will worship the alternative heroes offered by culture. How difficult is it to get people to read, especially young people who are surrounded by so many distractions and gadgets and social media, to say nothing of these uh, secular-generated heroes? Yeah, it's become the norm to say, I want to turn my brain off. I want to shut myself off from mm. the world. And yet what they mean by that is that they're going to turn on their devices. They're going to turn on their screens. So you're actually letting go of parts of yourself to be plugged in, to be slaved away to something that is controlling your imagination, that's making you less active and less contemplative. And the call to be a Christian is to be one who meditates on words, prays words, and hopefully leads you towards, you know, a greater vision beyond yourself, your place in the community, your place among other persons. And a lot of these devices mm -hmm. just feed this idea that what you want matters who you want, you know, what you want to read uh, doesn't matter as much as what you consume and what you produce. And it really makes you less of a person than, than the scriptures call you to be. Tell me about the writers that attract you. You've written books about Walker Percy, who lived across the lake from me, uh, Flannery O'Connor, Graham Greene, uh, C.S. Lewis. Your book is very ecumenical. But there are an awful lot of Catholic writers. How do their works illustrate holiness for you? Well, the Catholics are in touch with things, you know, Cath the Catholic Church never lost its priority on the things. And then, of course, what those things signify is part and parcel mm -hmm. of the thing itself. And so a lot of Catholic fiction feels very comfortable with the significance within matter in a way that the Protestant mm -hmm. tradition kind of broke away and separated the matter from the spirit in a lot of the ways that they worship and the way that they talk about things. And so you have fiction mm -hmm. that's more didactic, that's more focused on prose or sermons, um, mm -hmm. whereas the Catholic fiction really digs down underneath things and and looks beyond the surface to say, okay, what does it mean? What, why does it matter? Uh, what, you know, the enchanted mm -hmm. worldview that, that was kind of retained by the Catholic Church. And I think that that's something that a lot of people are missing. You know, we're, we're surrounded by a world that is driven by advertising and a Gnostic universe in which you are just the persona that you represent on social media. Mm. And fiction really pulls us back into a story in which what we're doing matters and how we do it matters. Hmm. You write that C.S. Lewis is the 20th century's primary defender of the imagination. You go on to say uh, that it's important, uh, imagination is important. And while Christians love talking about how to live better, how to help people, how to fight injustice, and so on, we too often do so as an intellectual exercise. We push imagination to the side as fantastical and unnecessary. Fiction offers an escape and has nothing to do with the practice of faith, but the imagination has everything to do with our faith. How we imagine our God, our world, and ourselves affects how we live and how we die. Have we lost that Christian, that Catholic imagination? I mean, Tolkien and Lewis were, were, were men of faith who shared a love of literature and fan fantasy. Uh, you know, as someone who teaches at a university, how important is it to have a liberal arts education at a university level that features courses in classical literature, particularly the literature you're writing about? Absolutely. So the liberal arts, I mean, that's the arts of freedom. It's practicing having a free soul. That's what they're supposed to do, is that they train you to desire the things that are in line with who you are. Whereas a lot of what the world does is try to enslave you to things that make you less than what you are. So imagination is key to really change people's desires. Um, William Wordsworth said, what we will love, they will love, and we will teach them how. Education should be all about training the loves to love what is worth loving. And our stories, we really enter into a world in which what we're supposed to love, what is true, 
what is beautiful, what excites mm. our soul and really calls us to be grander and greater than we we truly are. And um, something that is beyond ourselves is exciting. And I think those those grand adventures, the adventure of sanctity, um, is the greatest call. And education should be leading yeah. us towards that call. Mm. In the book, you write about the role of suffering uh, in in the search for God and how some writers are particularly adept at writing well about suffering. You point to Flannery O'Connor, who suffered with lupus her entire writing career. Uh, she had this to say about suffering in her characters. She wrote, it has always seemed necessary to me to throw the weight of circumstances against the characters I favor. The friends of God suffer. How can literature like this help us not only understand suffering, but see how it draws us to God? Yeah, well, suffering is part of the human condition. It is the state of the fallen world. So we can't, you know, control that. We can't get out of all suffering. And the illusion that we can, I think, is problematic because then suffering surprises us when in reality mm -hmm. it's something that should be part of our lives and not something that we flee from. What's the the horror that Flannery O'Connor is always talking about is the fact that God can redeem all suffering, that no suffering is beyond his ability to use it to instrumentalize that suffering mm -hmm. for his good. And that is a scandalous thing to say, but it's absolutely true. The worst of suffering God can use for the greatest of his glory. Mm. Uh, talk to me about something you touch on in the book, and it's this, uh, you say there are a number of Christians who sort of they're always looking for the rainbow, you know, over Noah's Ark, and, and they don't want to, you know, experience the precursor or talk about it. Uh, and, you know, I, I call this the fake literature uh, that moves from perfection to perfection, you know, unlike uh, the more gritty uh, realization of, of, of faith lived that Flannery O'Connor or this new Father Stu movie that's coming to theaters uh, touches on. Uh, what, what do we lose by focusing on the cross without the suffering, the happy oh, cross, exactly as someone right. once said. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, this is this, the whole story of the world. The story that's revealed to us in Scripture is a story that is about fall and redemption. It's about Good Friday and resurrection. And if we just mm. move from resurrection to resurrection to resurrection, I mean, what is being brought back to life? You have to have— right what is dead be brought back to life. You have to see the suffering of the cross. And without that, you have a false conception of the world. And, and also you have a false idea of how to enter into that. I mean, suffering will make you uncomfortable. Death will scare you. But if you believe that on the other side of death is resurrection, then you have nothing to fear in this world. Yeah. What do you hope readers get from your book? Why did you write it? I hope they love more. I, I hope that my book encourages people to see what is worth loving. Uh, it is a very dark world. It's a dark time, and people have definitely suffered a lot in the last couple of years. I hope the book instead turns us to some of these beautiful souls and says, the adventure of pursuing holiness is a great call, and the call is yours. And if you follow it, the Lord will grace you with a increased capacity to love others. Hmm. I've read that you're working with the estate of Flannery O'Connor to complete her unfinished third novel, Why Do the Heathen Rage? Uh, how do you even undertake a challenge like this? I really enjoyed it. I, you know, I can't really separate my voice from Flannery very much. That's actually been the criticism of my first book was that I couldn't, t the reader couldn't tell the difference between Flannery and me um, because I have been reading her since I was 15. So for me, learning mm. how to read and how to write has come so much from Flannery. And it's just been such mm. a privilege to get to see what she was working on, to see that unfinished story. Uh, Carl Rahner says, all we bring to God are unfinished symphonies. And you really get to see Flannery's unfinished symphony. And hopefully, I get to share the unfinished symphony in the next year or two with everyone. Wow, how cool is that? Well, we'll be looking forward to that. Meanwhile, the scandal of holiness renewing your imagination in the company of literary saints by Jessica Hooten Wilson is available now at bookstores everywhere and online. Jessica, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that is all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now.